we're going to have. Thank you, Jim. We're going to have Jeff Carlson, who's our natural course, uh, um, natural resource director and beach manager, and our agent for the Conservation Commission, come up and talk about current regulations, both state and local, and some of the things that we do and do not do on the island. So, Jeff, and then we'll have questions after that. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to thank the Civic League for having me, and it's not often that I get to come in and present. I usually get to see people as part of active permitting or, unfortunately, sometimes as an enforcement action. So that led me to the title of my slide. Oops, I needed a permit for that. This is a pretty famous enforcement action we took in the last year uh, in regards to the construction of essentially a bulkhead with some, some fencing in front that we were there. Um, a little background on myself before I get started. Just for those of you who don't know me, I originally moved out to Nantucket in 2000 and was brought out by Nantucket surveyors and was their environmental permitting specialist for six years. So I dealt with a lot of wetland delineation, a lot of design of projects and permitting of projects. And then after that, switched to the town in 2006 as the beach manager under Dave Franzuto and kind of moved into my new role as the CONCOM administrator, where instead of trying to get things permitted, I essentially help people present to the board, review projects, and then aid the board for whatever they need in constructing their projects. So I'm gonna give a brief overview and kind of our local rules and regulations and what we do, some examples of some projects for what we see, and then how, more importantly, how the Conservation Commission evaluates projects that you as a homeowner may be interested in doing. So the Conservation Commission, this is our main task, is we administer the Wetlands Protection Act for the state, that's chapter 131, section 40, and we also have a local bylaw Chapter 136 and our local wetlands protection regulations. And a permit is required for any alteration of land within a resource area or within 100 feet of a resource area. So our coastal resource areas that we're kind of focused on today for kind of our coastal erosion and our erosion control forum today, we're primarily looking at, and Jim did a great job discussing land subject to coastal storm flowage, coastal banks, coastal beaches, coastal dunes. We also locally have a, a resource area we call coastal dune field. And then we also, as you else, have barrier beaches. So these are the ones that we are primarily dealing with as far as erosion control structures. Other coastal wetlands we have include, obviously, salt marshes, salt ponds, um, other fish runs, endangered species habitat. But we're not looking at those as much as they relate to erosion control structures. So this is kind of a great slide for us. This is a, a site actually on the island where we can see a number of, of coastal resource areas. I can get this right. So we have our land under the ocean, way in the corner here. Our coastal beach, which is obvious. And then from our coastal beach, we have a nice coastal dune. You can see it's coastal dune. It's all wind and water deposited sand that we've had over time. And then behind it is a nice vegetated coastal bank uh, that hasn't started to erode. But if you were to dig into that coastal bank, you'd see that glacial outwash material that Jim spent a great deal of time talking about, where you'd see a lot of unsorted rocks and pebbles and all the different, different, different mix up clays, silts as opposed to just this wind deposited sand. Um, so when we, when we review a project and the application comes in, it's not always as simple as we're dealing simply with the impacts to coastal bank, as we're frequently looking at like a project like this, what the impacts are to all of these resource areas that are here. This is the other one we have. This is Barrier Beach. We also discussed this a little bit. It's just the barrier between essentially the Nantucket Harbor and the ocean in this case or it's one water body to another, usually very narrow. Um, they're probably also, by our local regulations, our most restrictive resource area. We do not allow any building on resource areas, any new building on resource areas. Um, you can maintain structures and move sand around a little bit and maintain septic systems. All right, so this is what the meat and potatoes of what we do at the Comcom is. This is what needs a permit. So from our resource area here, in this case, the top of bank, which runs along the top, we have the resource area itself, which has a certain set of standards, and then we have our buffer zones. So we have the 
zero to 25 foot, and for all of our wetlands on Nantucket, um, it's an undisturbed buffer zone, so no activity is permitted in there without a waiver to our regulations. The 25 to 50 foot in between the red and the blue lines is uh, no structure zone, but you can do activities like landscaping or other light development in the area are 50 foot to 100 foot, so between the blue and the green, structures are permissible with the permit. And then outside of 100 feet, so outside of the green line, is our limit of jurisdiction. So anything that happens kind of down in here while still subject to you know zoning and HDC and planning board and all those things is outside of the CONCOM jurisdiction. So we're really only concerned from the green line kind of out to infinity for, for what we have. All right, so if you need a permit, this is the step that you have to go through. Um, you need to file an application with the Conservation Commission. We have a number of permits. We have a notice of intent, a request for determination. Depending on what you want to do, what information you're looking to approve or gain will vary on the permit. We always recommend that you, uh, you're you going to need a licensed engineer to sign or stamp the plan. It's very important. It's what verifies information for the board to review. The board can only make decisions on what they're judged on on the information that they receive and they can verify. So the better the information that comes in or the better the certification is that the better decision that the Conservation Commission can make. And then part of that process requires public notice, and then you begin your public hearing process. So this is, this is again what the CONCOM does. We evaluate the projects from resource area to resource area, and, and Jim talked about this just, just briefly. In the state regulations and the local regulations, each resource area is defined for what they do and certain interests that they help protect. It may be something from flood control to erosion control to storm damage prevention. And it explains in the regulations what those things do to aid in that. So for erosion control or flood control, you'll see you know, a coastal bank is a, a vertical barrier or provides sediment to, to maintain that dune or maintain that beach. And the dune somewhat the same. So when we look at these projects, we want to be able to identify what the impacts are going to be and how that's going to affect these interests that we protect. So, when we do this, we create these performance standards. This is one from our local regulation here. This is just from our coastal bank section. Um, that all projects shall be restricted to activity as determined by the commission to have no adverse effect on bank height, bank stability, wildlife habitat, vegetation, wetland scenic view, or the use of a bank as a sediment source. That last portion ties to the state regulation, what Jim talked about, about being sure that dunes and banks are always providing that sediment source. That's kind of the main function to the maintenance of the beach and the protection of the areas that are land of those things. So when you file your application, just if you would like to, you know, build a house within 50 feet at the top of your coastal bank or put an erosion structure on the beach or any other project onto the beach, we have to be able to judge how that project is going to affect our interests and then use our performance standards to help make an informed decision. That may take multiple meetings or multiple requests for information, but that's essentially what the seven-member board has to do and has to determine. <coughs> so I apologize to Jim for using the word solutions. That's one of we regulators like to use on occasion. But uh, when we come these in, these are the kind of things that we see as far as erosion control projects. We see hard solutions or hard, hard alternatives like bulkheads, riprap, seawalls, jetties, growings. And we have examples of all of these all over the island that we can see. And then we also have now more soft solutions that, that the commission sees like sand drift fencing, um, nourishment and plantings, um, other kinds of fencing. Um, depending on how people view on it, we also see a lot of a lot of core logs that are filled with sand that kind of slow release sand, which can be kind of a hard or kind of a soft, depending on how you'd like to look at it. Um, and then the commission has to determine whether or not it's a coastal engineering structure. That's kind of the, the, the crux of what we get at here, because by the state regulations and our local regulations, a coastal engineering structure could not be permitted to, pre to protect a home that was constructed after the enactment of our regulations. So post-1978, you don't gain the protections of a coastal engineering structure. There may be other alternatives that you have. We always encourage retreating, if, you, if possible, or you can always turn to a soft, a soft solution like nourishment and some plantings to try to protect your bank, protect your dune, and protect your beach, ultimately. There's some pictures. This is just a the bulkhead down at down at the steamship wharf and tying to Jim again, you can kind of see that over here there is a little beach that kind of ties into this little tiny dune that's out there over the day. And then if you come around, you can see the flat on Easy Street that's there that forms that low tide. But in front of these areas, 
There's no beach. There just never is. Um, we see that a lot for a lot of our jetties. And I have another slide that we'll see that a little bit later on. Or else you can see this is another sloth solution on the north shore of the island where a homeowner has turned to more of a, a snow fencing with nourishment. And then you can see all the little grass plugs that are planted in there in hopes that the grass, when it roots in, will help stabilize that sand so it's not as prone to wind and water erosion. But the sand can still come off. Or if there's a storm event, when the waves interact with that, it can still take sand pretty freely. It's not restricted by a wall. It's not restricted by anything that really hampers its access to, to a road and, and maintain the beach in front. So in review of these, we want to be sure that when we look at our potential impacts that we're dealing with here, um, we want to look at loss of beach um, and other resource areas. So if we're looking at a hard structure, how long will that hard structure be able to maintain the beach in front? If they have nourishment proposed, will it maintain? Will it not maintain? What will the impacts be? We want to look at the adverse impacts to habitat, both aquatic and terrestrial, especially on Nantucket, where bay scallops and clams are a major industry for us in our harbor. If we put an erosion control project on the inner harbor, how is that going to affect our eelgrass beds? How is that going to affect our habitat that's there? How is it going to affect their ability and that commercial fishery to maintain itself? Um, we also want to avoid projects that will create a peninsula and create end scour and then off-site impacts as well. And an issue that we've just started to talk about a lot at the commission and we're seeing more and more is the big elephant in the room of cumulative impacts. What are these structures going to do? What are these projects going to do when we line up ashore with a number of them on the beach? Or what's going to happen to the holes in between them? What is, what is it going to do to the public beaches that we have that don't have these projects? as a system in a whole. And when you look at the, the slides and we look at the big areas that, that Jim had put up, at what point are you going to be affecting the greater, the greater area? And this is a, a question that we've been wrestling a lot with as a commission for everything from beach stairs and access points to erosion control structures to just you know walkways from a house out to the water. Um, just how much is enough before you start to have a real negative impact on these resource areas, both upshore and downshore. So this is just some examples of impacts. And this is another site on Nantucket on the North Shore. You can kind of see here that this house has constructed a bulkhead um, that was permitted a, a long time ago. But you can see where it's created a little peninsula of itself. The land back here that doesn't have any protection actually goes back much further now. And then in these corners, it's come back but it's also started to scour again at the ends. You can see where it's wrapped in to the point where they've tried to put stones. And then even there, it still <coughs> created a similar problem um, of those building out. So those are the impacts, and that's kind of the real impacts that we're having to deal with when we see these. What exactly is it going to do in the long term? Or what is it going to do in the short term to, to protect these homes? So these are the steps that, that we take as part of the commission to, to minimize these. Uh, we take great care to be sure that when we talk about nourishment volumes, that, that nourishment volume is, is sound for, we can look at our erosion rate, and I'm pretty proud of our commission for the fact that not only do we look at that 150 year trend that CZM puts on the map, as we look in terms of even 20 years or even inside that 20 years, even down to a five or six year window to really judge what's happening on that site. Are we getting a true depiction of the erosion profile that's there? what's coming off for a year and what needs to be replaced. What needs to be able to be available to the system to not starve the beach, but still protect the bank that's there. So we also take the time to verify our sand source and sediment analysis. So if you want to do nourishment on the beach, we like to be able to ensure that the sand that you're picking up is compatible with the sand that's there. We obviously don't want to dump you know, a bunch of peat and mud to replace beach sand. It's just not a good idea. Um, and then we also require things site-specific photographs, monitoring and management plans, uh, off-site monitoring. Um, we require at a minimum, usually biannual or even quarterly reviews that get presented to the board for review. Part of our role, is, I feel, is to gather data for the community to help look at that so we can look at what the cumulative impacts are and see what six projects are in a row on the South Shore or on the North Shore, what's that doing to the system? Are there design flaws that we can, we can work with people to make changes, to make better projects that achieve the goals both of the commission and of the property owner? Um, we have been working very hard on failure criterion. So at what point, failure criteria for us is, what point does that project fail? 
is it no longer providing protection for our interests and no longer protect, providing proper protection for that home? And then how do we deal with that? Is it removal? Is it redesign and replacement? Um, failure criteria is unique from site to site, and that's really the interesting part of all these projects is from site to site, it's always very different. Each site is definitely unique for its dynamics and how it fits. And then we also have been trying to establish to be sure that if it is a project that has a structure, that there are proper funds that are held in place by either the town or a third party, that if the homeowner changes or leaves the project or just throws up their hands and say, I give up, I don't know what to do anymore, if that project is having an adverse impact, we have the ability to remove it and have that funded. So just as an example of how we do monitoring areas, um, as you can kind of see here again, we have our project area here in the middle. You can see just kind of the zigzag fences down there. Um, and then we also include in the monitoring area where they do um, bank locations, high water lines, topography, condition of vegetation, and dune profiles, if there are dunes, through this area here. And then they also have to go a distance that's determined by the commission both to the east and the west or the north and the south, depending on which shore you're facing. That data is brought before the commission. Everyone looks at it. It's verified usually by a third party just to be sure we know what's going on so we can really get a grand picture of what's going on. We usually require this either twice a year uh, with a component that after major storms, the similar information comes in, or we uh, have greater than that. Some of the projects have been quarterly. Um, and it's information that as we gain, it's information that we can use during our coastal management plan process or with other projects to review to say, we've seen this project up on this shore, we've seen this project in this area, it hasn't been functioning the way that it's designed to function. We need to really think about how we're doing this or if there are revisions that we can make to have a better project and a better design to our project. And these are some of the other requirements that we have, we have applicants do with our coastal, coastal erosion projects is we require marking and branding of all the materials. So everything from wooden posts to you know, core logs with unique threads through them, we make sure that everything's marked so if it does fail and it's retrieved, we know where it came from. That's very useful information to see not only where things are being transported to, but sometimes if we've had a number of projects that have taken damage, we can really dial in where it belongs and where those impacts have been. Um, we also require the amount of renourishment to come in. Um, just keeping things in good repair, and then just regular reporting and maintenance. Um, I guess i just continue a little bit before I get into a few thank yous, but um, the role of the commission that we have, I, I really feel has been, been important to this point and kind of the gateway for people to provide this information for groups like the Coastal Management Plan to come in and be the source of information on Nantucket for what's really a unique situation. We're probably one of the few spots in Massachusetts that deals with, well, obviously, with deals with erosion on all four sides, on the, all four shores. Um, and it's very different. I mean, we have Nantucket Sound to the north, the Atlantic Ocean to the east and to the south, and our inner harbors too. It's a very unique spot. Um, we've been doing a really good job being progressive in addressing these things in advance. Our regulations are typically more restrictive than the state regulations, and I think have been very progressive for the things that we've been looking at as far as everything from septic technology being alternatives for, for coastal areas and our watersheds, our fertilizer regulations, and I think now that we've really taken a big step to deal with erosion in our coastal management and our coastal management plan. And the CONCOM has always been, for lack of better terms, kind of on an island with this for years and years. And now we have all these other work groups that are building to, building to a whole. I think that's really what's important. So I was on the 15 minute talk today. So um, I'd just like to give a quick big thank. They don't get enough credit. Our seven commission members, which I know a few are here, um, our chairman, Ernie Steinauer, um, obviously Dr. Ate, uh, Jen Carberg, Ian Golding, Andrew Bennett, Michael Wacky, and John Braddington Smith, um, our seven unpaid individuals that spend hours and hours doing this for the community and spending their time and spending an immeasurable amount of hours reviewing projects and really taking their time and making smart decisions that are justified and hopefully clear to people that are there. Um, I wish everyone could see them in action at least once because they do a, a, a phenomenal job. Um, obviously, thanks to the Civic League, thanks to the Coastal Management Plan Work Group, um, who most of which are here today, I guess not everybody. And then uh, my other folks in our department that spend time working on this as well, our shellfish biologist, Tara Riley, 
Um, it provides a lot of information and review as far as impacts of aquatic habitats. And then our newly on board, J.C. Johnson, our Natural Resources Enforcement Officer, who's spending a fair amount of time going around and doing uh, site inspections and verification of data that we have come in. It's, uh, they're, they're great people to have with us as well. Um, and again, we're always open. We, um, we're open from 9 to 12 guarantee. Um, I'm usually there. That's our physical location and phone number. And please, if you have any questions or concerns or you see something you're not sure about, if you're out on the beach, you're out walking your dog, um, or you see everything from you know, a clover fence or a least turn fence that's up, if you have questions, we're a resource for you. We're not there just to file papers and, and sit there and, and go walks on the beach. So please come in um, and, and chat. We'd love to have people in. We'd love to answer questions. Um, I know Jim and I will answer questions at the end of this, and hopefully that was helpful for everyone a little bit. I know not everyone has to participate in the CONCOM process. And that's what we're hoping to do today is give kind of a really brief overview for, for how the Conservation Commission works. So I'll turn it back to Sarah. We'll have some questions. <laughs> you did great. Um, I am going to um, officially adjourn the Coastal Management Plan meeting, but this meeting is not adjourned. We're going to take questions. Um, if people don't mind and they have some questions, I think we should take them and try to take advantage of these two guys being here. And I also appreciate everyone that came here and everything, all the help from the Civic League. Dave? I just want to let everybody know that we do have a new people footnotes that the town will hopefully adopt in July of 2014. And if you want to know whether your property is in an A zone or a velocity zone, just call my office and I can show you the maps digitally or show you the hard copies. You know, if you copy, you know, if you copy. We've been presenting coastal uh, shoreline change information at our coastal management plan meetings. Our next CMP meeting is May 6th from 5 to 7 at the PSF probably upstairs in the training room. We've also been presenting these FEMA maps. So um, do you all have some questions for these guys? Oh, <laughs> Jim has, oh, let me get our, the audience question, yes. Uh, thanks, I just have one question for Mr. O'Connell. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on near shore type solutions, such as artificial reefs, concrete precast modules, uh, anything like that thoughts of how that might, might work here or not, or that you may have seen in other locations? Uh, his question was, uh, if I had any, if I had any uh, information or an opinion on uh, near shore reefs, in, you know, near shore uh, breakwaters and other things of that fashion, there's, <clears throat> there's a variety of different types of um, breakwaters that have been in, used throughout the country, and you're putting me on a spot here in a way. But not really. Um, I have a technical opinion and a personal opinion. I'll leave my personal opinion out. <laughs> break, uh, near shore and offshore breakwaters have been used in a number of areas around the country. I don't see any new ones being built. And I think that's primarily because of the expense, initial expense, <clears throat> and the uh, and the maintenance expense of them. But I have seen I have seen near shore breakwaters in several areas work well, and I've seen them not work so well. Um, they are very, very tricky. I've seen them uh, cause accelerated erosion of the area landward of them. I've seen them cause accelerated erosion of areas down drift of them. And I've also seen them work fairly well. <clears throat> so um, I guess personally I would like to see, um, I'd like to see a couple of experimental areas somewhere in Massachusetts or Rhode Island or somewhere in the New England area. I'd like to see a couple of experimental areas set aside and with intense selection, intense monitoring, and, and try it and see if it works. But there's so many different environments, rocky intertidal shores, sandy areas, biological habitat, there's, ex there's an extreme amount of uh, monitoring and upfront up scientific data that would be need, need to be collected. Um, but I, um, the, jury's out, the jury's out in my mind. If you look at, um, for example, Lake Michigan, there's 56 near shore detached breakwaters in Lake Michigan. And if you go on Google and look at them, they appear to be functioning fairly well. If, if they're designed properly and they're, and they're put in the right location and that you're nourished behind them, this, the, you know how the whole sand trans system, it's a system, it all works as a system. But once, once the system gets into a, 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 
equilibration. Um, you can have the sand move through the system and still help protect the areas. What happens is when you've got the longshore transport system, you put a breakwater in front of it, it slows the longshore transport system in the aerial landward of the breakwater. And it usually results in some, um, some rate of accretion behind the breakwater. So you'll end up with um, usually a little what we call a salient. That's just a bulge in the sand. But once that bulge forms, you, you can still get sand moving through the system and have very little impact down drift. But in some cases, we have seen it backfire and actually you know, <clears throat> cause erosion. Breakwater's too close to the shore, create a hydraulic head, suck the sand out, and you, it backfired, you wasted your money. But in, I think in the right location, with, um, with some really solid science behind it, um, I wouldn't mind seeing a few experiments. The one when you're flying into Logan Airport, the Five Sisters, was disastrous. They're trying to do beach nourishment up now and there because they didn't work well. But when you're flying into Logan on the north-hand side, you'll see a, a failure of them. But there are other areas where they have, where they have worked. But I, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen any built lately in, in my own observations. But that's not to say that the jury's, the jury's out on them, I think. Referring to the new the, the flood insurance rate maps and the the um, the limit of uh, the limit of the limited area of moderate wave action, I believe they call it. I was calling it the coastal A zone. It's it's used synonymously, but for the famous purposes in the flood insurance rate map, it's to the limit of moderate wave action, which is that area from three foot down to one and a half feet. Um, my understanding is, is and I was going to ask Dave this. Um, FEMA will put those on your flood insurance rate maps at the request of the community. They can be advisory, or they can be um, voted in by a town to be regulatory. It's the community's decision. FEMA's not taking any action on it, but they will put it on the flood insurance rate maps for you and leave it up to the community whether or not they want it to be just advisory for themselves and the homeowners, or whether or not you actually want to take action. What FEMA's suggesting, they know now that a one, one and a half foot to three foot wave can cause structural damage. What they're suggesting is, they're suggesting that communities adopt V-zone standards in the limit, uh, in, the, in that area. But that's up to the community. And I was gonna ask Dave, I don't know if they were put on these maps here. They're on, they're on the map. Oh, okay. It's a fantastic it's, education. It's, yeah. That's how, yeah, that's how yeah, it's not regulatory in terms of the federal government. It's, it's advisory and it's up to the community to decide what they wanna do with it. Um, just to, to add to that a little bit for you, Paul. Um, that's a part of the process that they've put on as inclusion for here, and when it comes to town meeting as part of discussion, that'll be part of the discussion as part of the adoption of that meetings, whether or not that regulatory line is there and maintained or whether it's just that advisory line. So that, like Jim had said, it has to go through the town, but it has to go through town meeting as well. So that'll be part of that, that discussion and that process. So I'm sure, like our regular warrant articles, will be some sort of recommendation from the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee on how that would work and then that would hit the town meeting floor for, for discussion from, from the, the citizens. So that's where we are. Was how, how do you how do you correct me if I'm wrong, how do you organize an effort to attempt to select a site that may be an experimental site for some type of near shore or offshore breakwater? Is that how do you, how do you begin the?
I, I, I don't have that information. Um, he was he was asking how do you how do you begin the organization to select a site to determine whether or not it's it's feasible. Um, I have I have not been involved in any um, selection of a site nor the construction of a breakwater because I have I haven't seen any built recently. I will tell you that. Um, the alternatives of analysis for Humber Rock Beach in the town of Situate, which is a, a, a highly densely developed barri barrier beach that's um, extremely hazard prone to northeast storms, and the Corps of Engineers did an alternatives analysis. I think the breakwater was, was approximately, and this was going back to the mid-1990s, the breakwater was approximately $20 million for initial construction. Beach nourishment was about $6 million. Buying out the houses was on the order of the breakwater. Um, so I think it was the, so that's the only experience I have really. The, I think the, it was the expense of the breakwater that sort of put that on the back burner. Uh, and, and they went for the beach nourishment project instead of the, the breakwater. But I haven't been involved in, in the selection of the site. But I wouldn't mind seeing an effort somewhere where if it backfired, perhaps it wouldn't have an a, a extremely adverse effect just to, just to, to see how it functions. Because it, it has been proven that they do create habitat. It changes the habitat, and in this state, um, that's that's frowned on. Alter changing one habit to one habitat to another, in my experience, the state is not open to. They want to maintain the habitats as they are, because I think mankind has messed up a lot in the past. But that's not to say we can't be creative and open-minded in some way. So I don't have your answer. Thank you. Hopefully, maybe the Coastal Management Plan Work Group can have. Jim back to discuss specific ones. David, yes. Uh, speaking of matching up the environment, uh, what do you think about the sound of the beach uh, protecting the uh, plant they have on the back of the track? Jim. Oh, David. I'm sitting here. I'm sorry. I can't say because you're working with the government here. I'd rather hear an opinion from somebody who's outside the I heard the first part of the question, which was, um, what is my opinion about the, the efforts of the Saskatchewan Beach Preservation Fund? Exactly. What do you think about the latest plan? The other two, the first two didn't work. So the, the, like, the, 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 the Quar Raps? Well, they had mm -hmm. first, and they oh, yeah. This may be the first time I've done this, but I don't think it's appropriate for me to answer that question in a public forum. You, I, my, I think my lecture speaks for itself, and I'd prefer not to make an opinion on a private project. Well, I'll talk to you privately. <laughs> okay. Any other uh, questions? Yet another 50 slides showing various types of coastal engineering structures. And perhaps we can bring them back to the Coastal Management Plan work group and go through some of those slides and see some before and after so we as a, a work group can learn more about various types of engineering structures being used around the island. Um, I quickly want to remind people our next uh, Civic League meeting um, will be on an equally fun topic on SEALs uh, on May 20th at 4.30, I think, at the, here again, or at the Public Safety Facility, Liz? at the PSF at 4.30 on May 20th on a Monday. Our executive meeting is May 6th, Monday night at probably 4, 4.30 at the Land Bank office. Any other last minute questions before we all enjoy some food and each other's fellowship? No? Jim will be here until early tomorrow morning if you all want to meet with him and hopefully we can get him back on the island. I want to thank Jim O'Connell. Jeff, you did an awesome job. Um, Jeff's done an awesome job. <laughs> Jim's been very gracious to come over here now that he's got two or three hats. So I want to thank the whole Civic League, um, Liz, Mary, um, folks that brought food and water, uh, both TV stations. We've got uh, GenoTV.com. This will be streaming tomorrow uh, on, in the rotation, and you can do it on demand by going to GenoTV.com. This is also on NCTV's um, Channel 22, our local 18. Sorry, 18, yes. 17, 18, so many channels. Uh, channel 18, and when will that be on tomorrow? Um, or the next day? I think it'll be on the next day. I want to say around 6 o'clock. Okay, around 6 p.m. on hopefully on Wednesday night. 
um, you'll be able to watch that. And uh, is there a way to also access it on the web? NantucketCommunityTelevision.org. Pardon? So you can get it on demand. You can see from different angles, maybe different lighting, you know, compare editing styles now. It's really awesome that both Gino and uh, our, our community television are here. We really appreciate the fact that these guys come and film these type of events because we want as many people as possible to see these speakers. So I appreciate all of the audience that came, the coastal, the, the commissioners that have come, the CMP group that came, and everyone at the Civic League. And feel free to ask questions of these guys while you have them. Thanks a bunch.